Hello everyone, it's Debbie Carr here from Vox Presenters and I'm very pleased to be coming to you live tonight and we've got a couple of great guests and we're going to talk to you about overcoming your fear of public speaking and of course you've probably heard that most people are more afraid of speaking in public than they are of dying which is ridiculous. So we're going to get rid of all those fears for you tonight and uh, we're going to start off with the fabulous Blake Bauer. Now I'll just read a little bit of, of, to you about Blake, about Blake, who I met a couple of, uh, oh, maybe four or five months ago now at Mind, Body, Spirit, and we instantly connected. He's a fabulous, fabulous person. Blake D. Bauer is an internationally recognised spiritual teacher, energetic healer, and author. His pioneering work centres on cultivating conscious awareness and unconditional self-love in the present moment as the keys to healing yourself, fulfilling your life's purpose and re realising your greatest potential both personally and professionally. And I'd just like to add before I uh, we introduce um, Blake to come on and say hi, Blake uh, gave me his book to read after I met him which is here, I hope you can see it. I've read it twice now and it's all scribbled through with all my notes and I must say it really did help me so we'll get a chance to ask Blake a few questions about that during the show. So hi Blake, welcome to the show. Hi Deb, thank you for having me and thank you Sean. I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity to share and, and obviously this is an important topic so, um, so thank you. Yeah, it's a very important topic and I know you've done a lot of uh, professional and public speaking and you run many workshops. So could you just tell us a little bit about the first time and how did that make you feel? Yes, well, um, so Deb sent me through some questions to um, think about and to um, you know prepare for for today. And um, when I started to think about this one in particular, I started to think you know back to when I was a little kid and the first things that came to mind were um, you know, I used to write poetry when I was young and um, my parents got divorced when I was a little kid and I wrote a poem that won a contest and um, I was invited to speak at a bookstore in the United States, which is Barnes & Noble, which is a, you know, obviously a very well-known chain. It's the biggest bookseller in, in the United States. And, um, you know, and I think back to that time, I mean, I was writing about something that I was passionate about, something that was really close to home and something that was very important to me. So I don't remember being overwhelmingly nervous. I'm sure I was nervous, but I don't remember being overwhelmingly nervous. And that's because I was speaking about something that was so true for me and so important to me, which is a theme that I'm going to carry through our next 30 minutes, which is that, you know, when we are speaking about things that we're passionate about and things that we love, the fear of public speaking is not really an issue. It's when you know we're speaking about things that we have to, that we don't really like, or we're forced into a situation where the fear and the nerves can really take over. But once we, we learn to align with who we really are and why we're really here and what we really love, those things are not very strong compared to the love and the passion that begin to come through. So those were the first ideas that came to mind were you know sharing my poetry as a little kid um, I was also in plays as a little kid so I was trying to think you know where did it all start you know just speaking in front of people and obviously there were nerves there but um, uh, and obviously it wasn't professional I wasn't you know being paid um, so there was therefore wasn't the same expectations that people have especially when they're giving money and they expect something in return which can be you know can can put a lot of pressure on people um, and then, so when I think about the first professional public speech that I did, um, it came about through um, some very synchronistic events. I was at a retreat, a meditation retreat, with a very well-known uh, teacher, um, you know, kind of a How, how much further along with this, um, sorry, but how, how further along are we now? Are you still a child or you, this is as you got older? No, this is, this is definitely as a young man. This is once I've studied and, and was, you know, I guess, um, developed in my profession, you know, preparing to, to, to fully bring my stuff to the public in a much bigger way. So I've been working with people professionally um, and for, for those of you, you know, you heard a little bit about, you know, myself as my, my bio and my book, but basically, um, you know, through my own healing journey, my own spiritual journey as a, a human being, like all of us searching for happiness, searching for health, 
you know, searching for answers to who am, who am I, why am I here, so the purpose of my life. Um, so now I work with people to make sure they have the healthiest, happiest, most fulfilling life possible. Um, so all the work was aligned with that. Um, so unexpectedly, I was at a retreat with about 150 people in the mountains who were there. It was a spiritually based, health based, well being based retreat, and I was there as a guest. And um, I overheard the, the gentleman who was, you know, overseeing the retreat, who was teaching the retreat, that they had planned to do yoga in the morning at this retreat, and their yoga teacher canceled. And at that point, I was always, I would, I was already teaching a practice called qigong, which is very much like tai chi. So although I was so nervous and so anxious, I, be, I felt overcame with this energy of offering my services, which to make a long story short, I did, and unexpectedly ended up teaching my practices and speaking to a group of about 150 people for two mornings in a row for about an hour, an hour and a half each morning. Um, and this was my first exposure, unexpectedly thrown into the deep end um, with, you know, 150 people. And, um, you know, I was well, really that's probably, nervous. That's probably a good thing sometimes when you're thrown into the deep end. Uh, I remember that was a bit how it happened to me on the radio, thrown into the deep end too. And, you know, you, you're yeah. going to bomb or you're going to do something really good with it. So. Compared to, to that, that first experience where you, you spoke to what you're doing today, how much more confident are you? And give us a few tips that you do before you go on stage. So, of course, you do yoga, so I'm sure you're going to give us a few breathing techniques here. Yes. You know, there's so, I guess you know, there's so much to say. Um, when I think about, you know, if I think about it percentage-wise, when I was, when that first time I was thrown into the deep end, I probably was at a point of 75% confidence, let's say out of 100. So I was really confident in what I knew. I was really confident in my technique. It was just that 25% of a lack of experience of being in front of a lot of people. Today, I'd say I'm at a 99%. And I initially wrote down 100%, but then I thought to myself, you know what, that's not exactly true. Because the truth is, is I still get just a little bit nervous and a little bit anxious and people ask me you know before I'll do a big workshop or a big speech you know do you still get nervous are you nervous about tomorrow are you nervous about the workshop next week and I'm authentic and I say yeah just a little bit and um, and then I say and this is something I'm going to talk about is that when I connect to why am I doing this and the purpose for me speaking or the purpose for me giving a workshop which is always to help the people that I'm interacting with to improve the quality of their life both personally and professionally, I take the focus off of myself and I put it onto why am I there, basically the function I'm serving, and I've found that by not focusing on myself or how I come across or judging myself, the fear dissipates and I'm there to serve a higher purpose, you know, to bring That's, through what people yeah. need. So, That's a great um, tip. Yeah, I love that because you're saying because you, you're feeling and you're giving out and you're you know basic basically you're taking away your own ego aren't you right well that's the thing I mean I believe really I mean we, sh we, we we won't be put in front of a group of people and really a big group of people until we're ready and basically we get what we're ready for so sometimes in my my life I've been frustrated you know that I haven't had access to more people that my work hasn't taken off mm -hmm. But I've found that life always gives me exactly what I'm ready for when I'm ready. So when I'm ready to speak to more people, it happens. But that's because I'm ready for really what is a responsibility. Because when you have access to influence people's lives, that's a responsibility. And personally, I don't take it very lightly. Um, I so. love that. That's, yeah, that's true. It is a responsibility. Absolutely it is. You, you, that's and you know if someone has paid you to speak now we're talking about professional speakers but of course a lot of our listeners or, or viewers won't be professional speakers they're just going to speak for their business or for their sales but you're right if you, someone is paying you or if they've given their time in payment to come and hear you then you do you have an obligation to deliver and deliver it well right and if and if really if you don't know what you're talking about you probably shouldn't be in that position in the first place and if you don't, you won't last. So you may get an opportunity, but it's not going to stay, um, yeah. which is purposeful too because you should only be doing what you love and then you master what you love. And that's why people want to come hear what you have to say because you have become an expert, you have mastered it, and you do have something to offer. That's correct. 
And uh, sure. before you do go on stage, uh, what is it, what what can you teach us about breathing? Because I know that breathing, there is a technique that helps calm those nerves. What what is your technique? Well, the most important technique that I can share with regards to this, you know, of course it's important. I'll talk about it, but there's much more that makes this more effective before this, and that is. Um, just putting your tongue on the roof of your mouth. So, Deb, if you want to try, if you just put your tongue on the roof of your mouth and you close your mouth, close your mouth, and just breathe through your nose. And the idea is to fill your belly and your lower back and your chest and your shoulders as deeply as you can. And what that helps to do is two things that are really important, which is one, just so you, you increase body awareness so you're more aware of your body. But the second and most important thing is that when you do that and you focus on taking these slow, deep breaths, you allow the energy that's stuck in your head, which can be confused thinking, and you allow the energy that gets trapped in your heart, which is all, often anxiety, and we get a lot of anxiety in the beginning of public speaking, you allow that energy yeah. to drop and fill your body rather than just accumulating in your heart. But a more important point yeah. that I didn't address is preparation, because it yeah. doesn't matter yeah. how much how much breathing you do, if you're not prepared for what you're about to do or what you're about to deliver, you're going to be overwhelmed with that anxiety. So preparation was something I wanted to talk about, the importance of preparing and really preparing. Absolutely. So that Absolutely. when you show up. Yeah. I was just saying I just did that technique as you were talking to me and I felt very calm I must say and there would be a lot of people that I know, close friends would say that would be great to have Deb's mouth shut for a while, not yabbering on like she does. So, <laughs> but that's, thank you so much for sharing that. So please talk to us about preparation. Well first what, let's, while you're mentioning breathing, so practicing mm -hmm. that breathing technique often on your own before you're speaking just in your daily life, like personally the one thing, if I were to identify one thing that has helped me to transform my psychological, emotional, and physical suffering, uh, helped me achieve my goals personally and professionally. It was learning this type of meditation where I learned to focus on my breathing, take deep breaths, get into my body, get out of my head, stop thinking about the past and the future, and just address what's going on in my body right now. But we need to practice those things over time for them to become very natural and easy to slip into. It's like I say to people, you know, if you want big biceps, you got to go to the gym, you got to work out, and they don't just come in one go. You need consistency, and it's like that with everything. So even with a breathing practice that can help you when you're speaking, you need to practice and prepare. So for me, that was a part of my life for many years, which now I can just call on with the snap of a finger. But for many of us, we try and we're so overcome by anxiety that the, we can't focus on the breathing. So part of preparation is to focus on breathing when you're not under stress and you're not tested and you're not in front of people. So then when you are in front of people, it's much easier. So, you know, taking nice deep breaths every morning when you wake up as a meditation practice. You know, when you're driving the car, before you go to bed, when you're on the toilet, you know, there's so many opportunities to just sit and take deep breaths instead of just thinking. Yeah. So that's yeah, one thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And, and then the preparation part, I mean it goes back to the idea of when you do what you love, when you're when you're you're living your life's purpose, when you're when you're doing the work that you love and focusing on the things that you love or you're connected to what you love about the work that you do so that you can communicate that when speaking then that's part of the preparation. So part of the preparation is being in the right environment in the first place so you're not put in a situation to speak where you really don't want to be there, you're miserable, you don't like yeah. your job. Because then when you speak, you're not going to inspire anybody. It's just going to be regurgitated knowledge, basically. You know, And you're not going to want to connect with people either if you don't like where you are. So that's the first part of preparation is to be doing what you love, what you're passionate about. And then, obviously, to master that craft. Once you're there, and let's say you're not there, obviously, writing about, I like to write and take time to think and take notes. You know, what is the purpose for my speech? What is the purpose for my workshop? What do I want to achieve? And what do I want to give to people? So how do I want to serve people? How do I want to improve their life? 
So what's my intention for the end of the speech so that they can go away and make their professional life better or their personal life better or their relationship better or their relationship to money better? I talk a lot about self-love so that they can love themselves more. So I think about, again, why am I speaking? What is the ultimate intention to help and improve this person's or this group's quality of life? Um, you know, Which I guess you would have done for this show too, wouldn't you? You would. I'm sure you've put a lot yeah, of I mean, uh, thought into talking, this because you're giving us some great answers here. Well, I've got about. I did about six pages based on the questions that you gave me. Right. And because <laughs> oh, you know, because because but because I prepared, I what I thought about now is present. So I don't have to just be looking at it all the time, and that makes us very anxious too. When you haven't prepared and you're just depending on notes, then you're not present enough to connect with people, which we're all looking yeah. for connection, we're all looking for love. It doesn't matter if you're in a Fortune 500 business or corporation or you know at a personal growth workshop, everybody wants to connect and feel inspired and switched on and feel alive. So when you're speaking, you can't connect if you haven't prepared because you're too busy looking at your notes or what you've written out and trying to read it and then you're not connecting you're just worried about what you're saying so um, oh that is so good that's priceless advice I must say I, I really really appreciate it. and I'm, I'm as someone on you know interviewing you I'm honored that you've gone to so much trouble so if that's me sitting here and our audience will be thinking the same I'm sure so I can imagine if you're connecting with your audience in a live situation that they would feel very honored that you've prepared so much and gone to so much trouble fantastic what else have you got for us thank you I don't I'm not sure where, which question we're at um, <laughs> I'm just going on now we got let me talk about I can, um, go on please I, I can speak I, I put down some really great key points that you know I was surprised because I've never naturally focused on this topic as a as a as about in regards to sharing you know my experience but the, I was surprised with how much came out um, so as I said prepare 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 so that you can let go and just enjoy and be there and inspire with something that came through and again focusing on why you're speaking and what you want to give people so you take the focus off of yourself and make it about the other person like you said so it's not about your ego and how people perceive you or what they think of you or how they judge you or whether they like you it's about why you're there and what you're there to give them it's all about them and how you can help them and then you don't need to be self-conscious you know um, and, it, and it works it really does work um, it's, certainly, it's working for you and let me say now you, you do talk <laughs> a lot about love and yes can you give us a context of the difference between between love and fear? Because really, that's all there is, isn't there? So, how do we we focus on love and define fear? What's your definition of fear? Fear is just a well. I believe that all fear, which is just a, a, a paralyzed, a paralyzing emotion that keeps us stuck. And I believe all of our fears, our fear of death. Our fear of public mm. speaking, let's say those are the two most, fear of public speaking and fear of death, they all, every fear funnels back to a fear of emotional pain or feeling hurt. And in public speaking, that's often being rejected. So we've got our ego, which is our identity or who we think we are. So that becomes very engaged when it comes to public speaking is that, you know, we're afraid of being judged or not liked um, or being rejected, that people reject us or our ideas. Now, ironically, I was thinking about this, and a really interesting insight came through, which is that when you're public, when you're speaking publicly, you're supposed ultimately the highest ideal is to be sharing from your heart, your passion, what you love, what turns you on, what inspires you. But I think the key reason we all get so afraid when speaking publicly is because in order to really connect, you have to open your heart, and in order to open your heart. You have to heal all of the unhealed emotions and all of the pain from your past that you've never expressed, whether that's with mom and dad, past relationships, husbands, wives, or even with your boss. So all the stuff that's stuck in your heart from your life comes up, and that makes us very anxious. It's a lot to face. So I think public speaking actually brings up all the stored emotional pain in your subconscious, in your body, or in your heart. 
which is why it's so challenging and so vulnerable to have our heart open, if that makes sense. That, yeah, so. that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how. But so if you're doing right. what you love, if you're doing what you love, and this is the key, if you're doing what you love, that is so strong because it's aligned with the whole universe and all of life. It's so powerful that it will always overcome the pain and thus the fear, and and you'll be able to deliver the message that you're there to deliver because love is always more powerful than fear. And when you're stuck in fear. For example, thinking about how other people are going to judge me or if they're going to reject me or like me, then your heart becomes closed and you can't actually deliver the message. It doesn't matter if it's about personal growth or finances or sales or it doesn't matter what the topic is. If you're afraid of how other people are going to receive you or judge you or reject you, then your heart's going to be closed and you won't deliver it, you won't connect. But if you're doing what you love, which is stronger than that fear. It doesn't matter. Even if you do fear, we all, as human beings, we all fear rejection. We all fear getting hurt. We all want to be loved and liked and approved of. But when we're connected to our purpose and our passion, the love is so much stronger than the ego fear and those fears of judgment and rejection that it just blows it open, blows that out of the water. And then you're inspiring other people merely by doing that, not even by what you say, but just by doing it, you're inspiring people to do what they love. It doesn't even matter what you say. If they see you're alive, they think, I want to be that alive. I want to speak about what turns me on. You know, whether it's fashion, whether it's money, it doesn't matter. So. Absolutely, and I can see the passion coming out of your face and your eyes, and you, you know, and, and people say that about me too because I can't stop smiling when I talk about what I do because I just. I hang out with the most inspirational people in Australia. Yes. It's just such a great job. <laughs> well, thank you for so, inviting me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to even think about these things because some amazing insights have arose even in just the hour when I was taking notes leading up to, to our call. Um, so I appreciate it. So thank you for you know, giving me this opportunity to connect with you and, and then whoever you know, is listening. Well, that, that brings me to another point, which you did write about a, a lot in your book too, is is gratitude, because gratitude comes from love, and that makes you feel more happy and passionate. So what, can you tell us a little bit about gratitude, your feelings on, on that? Well, I think, you know, as human beings, we're really good at focusing on the negative, um, so it's not mm. easy, you know, in, in, in spiritual growth and self-help and um, personal development, there's a lot of talk of gratitude, but it's actually much more challenging to be grateful than we like to think it is because we're so programmed to focus on the negative, what we don't have, what we don't want. Um, so being grateful and starting a little bit of a practice on a daily basis to try and look for even just three things that you're grateful for in your life can start to reprogram your subconscious mind to be more positive and to appreciate the things that we do have. Um, you know, we live in the developed world, so a lot of people take food and water and shelter for granted, for example. But we can train ourselves to start to appreciate the home that we live in or the apartment or the room that we have or the food we eat or the clean water we have or the access to those things that we have. So we can start with those basic things. Um, you know, a lot of us suffer, which is, you know, I talk a lot about suffering and transforming our suffering. But when we're not suffering, life can be so good, right? So yeah. amazing and so pleasurable. So we take for granted even being alive and being in a body. Um, and, you know, we talked about, um, we talked about, you know, uh, some points that we're going to talk about later as far as how to transform our suffering. Um, and one thing I was gonna I was gonna mention is that most of us, you know, hold a lot of aggression, you know, towards our parents, for example, for bringing us into the world or for how they were with us as kids. So most deep down, we want to be here, we want to be alive. But a lot of us, on a subconscious level, have experienced so much pain and disappointment that we take life for granted. So one concept we might talk about in a little bit is forgiveness. So if you, I joke that if you can forgive yourself for choosing your parents. If you can forgive yourself for choosing your parents and the pain that that set in motion, then you can start to appreciate life and be more grateful for this opportunity because it is an opportunity. Um, there's a saying, and I don't know where it comes from, 
but it says that you know one kiss in the human body is worth all of eternity not in a body. So it's like the, the, the opportunity to experience love and pleasure and the senses, you know, it's something we take for granted. But I guess when it comes to speaking, to have the opportunity to share your passion, which is really why you're here, your purpose, to give out that love, to give out that passion, and to inspire other human beings is a gift. You know, so eventually once you get over the nerves and the stress, you get to feel how um, humbling and how much of an honor it is. Like, for example, for me to share this is a, is a huge honor, you know, and I'm very grateful for that. So. Yeah, so what I'm getting from you is that it's to put the ego aside. It's a place of giving and find your passion because obviously when you are passionate about something and you know your subject or you know what you, you're talking about, you are going to, to uh, emanate this wonderful passion and vibe and people are going to pick up on it. It's fa fantastic. Exactly. And, and it's, uh, about being, it's, about, Deb, it's about being yourself. Yes. So if you're in a job that you don't like or a position that you don't like that doesn't represent who you really are, then you can't just be yourself. But when you're doing work that you love or you're in a position that you love, you can just be yourself and be natural and speak from that place. But because we live in a world where so many people are disconnected from who they really are, public speaking is so much harder because we're not connected to just being ourselves, to being authentic. Um, which quickly I, was another point that I thought is just being vulnerable, being authentic, being human um, yeah. when you're speaking is so important. Not trying to put yourself on a pedestal. You know, I'm not perfect. I'm not better than you. Not coming from a place like that. Just saying I'm equal to you. And this is what I did to become successful. This is what I did to become great at what I do. And you can do it too because I'm just like you. Um, so to be vulnerable, yeah. speak from your experience speak on an equal playing field and tell your own stories from your own life you know to help open people's hearts um, you know those were some other key That's, points that came yeah. up so and you you do run workshops as well so that obviously you get in front of people to speak there do you ever bring do your delegates come up do they get to speak in front of other people and do you see them transform from being quite nervous then to a place of confidence Yes, well, I um I had a workshop on August 25th here in Geelong, and um, there was 80 people at that workshop, and um, it was at a beautiful venue, and that's so that's an all-day event. So I'm speaking from 10 in the morning until 6 p.m. So it's not just an hour yeah. keynote or something like that. So it's holding the space. So that's that's an intense experience. But for them, um, what I've done for myself, and and this is important, is that we're all looking for love and unconditional love and unconditional acceptance and safety and we all look outside of ourselves for that but I learned in my life that ultimately lastingly we can never find it outside of ourselves so we have to find it within ourselves we have to create a container in our own heart mind and body to accept ourselves and love ourselves unconditionally so that we can be ourselves no matter what even if other people judge us so when I create a workshop that's the energy of the workshop. People feel like they're at home, like they are accepted and can stay anything. So often throughout the workshop, I'll have people raise their hands and ask questions. And, and in the beginning, I set the tone of being vulnerable, admitting my flaws, talking about my life story, which gives people permission to be vulnerable, talk about their flaws, talk about their struggles, um, and express their truth. So I set the tone that way. And just by creating an environment like that where people actually feel safe to open up, and that's why I said if you're authentic and you speak from your heart, then everybody in the room, yeah. their heart's going to open. You know? Absolutely. If you're saying, you know, you this and I'm better than you or blah, 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 nobody's going to want to say anything. It's like a kid in school who's scared right. to raise their hand. And that's yeah, really where it <laughs> Yeah. Well, look, Blake, it's been absolutely wonderful to have, have you on. You're such an inspiration, and I know we're talking about hopefully getting you on our books and doing a few things. Where can we find you? What's your website? My, my website is www.unconditional-selflove.com, and I'm on Facebook, and as Deb said, I've got my book, and the book really helps you to unroot all of the psychological and emotional pain that blocks you 
uh, from speaking publicly because that's what's underneath all that fear, basically. Yes. So. Look, thank, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to have had you on, on this program and we're just about to bring in Anna Olsen who's another great inspiration. I just, As I said, I'm just full of inspirational people. Blake, we will be in touch. Um, you may wish to, to hang around or, or not, but uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Hello, thank Anna. You. Are you there? I am. Okay, I'm just going to read your bio. Not that I really need to, because we know, <laughs> I know, but I'm just going to read your bio, and you, you can come and have a few questions with us. So, Arnett Olsen first came to the attention of the Australian public as the larger-than-life performer with one heck of a set of vocal cords on the first season of the television series Pop Stars. The then larger-than-life singer left such a distinctive impression on the audience that a cult, followed, a cult following developed and by the time Arnett returned for the 2004 series, his fan base was snowballing with such momentum that it swept him to the finish in fourth place, cementing Arnett as a voice to be reckoned with. Now today Arnett is a popular blogger, MC, DJ, radio host, speaker and performer, and not to mention he has the best manager in the world. And that would be me. <laughs> Just to joke the other. <laughs> Welcome, how are you? Very well, thank you. Great. Now, Anna, you've been performing for many years now, but tell us about when you first started and tell and where you started. Your life story is quite interesting. Yeah, well, I was thinking about um, when you sent through the questions and uh, thinking about the first time getting up on stage as a little kid um, in church. And it was instinctive, um, and that's listening in to your um, your questioning uh, just before, I was thinking about how as we grow up we start to build up this these inhibitions, whereas as a child you don't think about it. You get up and you do what you love or what you're passionate about and you wanted to, I wanted to sing so I got up on stage and I was like, I'm going to sing and everyone's going to listen to me. Um, <laughs> they, they did? Yeah, they did, you know. <laughs> well, I think they did. <laughs> but I think as we get older, there's all these little things that start hanging off us that we carry along with us and they start to stop us or inhibit us from actually being able to do or talk about what we're really passionate about um, and that's been my biggest lesson is learning to go back to that place where I was as a child but with all the experiences that I have now so you know that little child that had you know they grew up with nothing lived in a one bedroom house uh, with a single mom and a brother getting up and doing what made him happy and what made him alive and that was performing that was you know sharing so it's just finding I think it was just finding lately I've had to go back to that moment and find that moment again um, and remind myself that you know it's okay to stand up and do what you love you don't have to be afraid Oh no, and you've you've got quite an inspirational story, I know, and uh, we will try we'll touch about on that a bit later as well. Now today you're out there, you're on, you've been on TV, you co-host a radio show with us, you're doing the blogging, you're out there, number one fan of Instagram, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you've got a great <laughs> ongoing joke between us. <laughs> you've got a great following. And, and you've got an inspirational story. Now, when you first started, when you went on to Pop Stars, yeah. how, how did you overcome, were you one, did you have fears and nerves and how did you overcome them? Oh, it, they definitely was. And it was weird because I was a lot, lot bigger. I was, I would have been about um, 200 kilos heavier than I am now. Uh, no, 200 I, kilos. I, was, I would have been about 200 kilos back then or more. Um, oh. And I remember going to the auditions and um, just before that I'd done a local program around Bankstown um, which was uh, in preparation for the Olympics and we were performing for the US Olympic team and for a few other things and it sort of gave me this sort of, um, this it brought to life that passion that I used to have when I was a kid in Fiji because um, when we moved to Australia I didn't think I could actually do, I could actually be a performer here. And I thought they were people that had been here for years and, you know, they were ahead of me. Um, you know, and there, there's the fears come through again and all that, all the little things that you carry along with you start to inhibit you and block you. And so by doing yes. those, it sort of opened me up and I thought, okay, um, I got uh, an acting agent, agent um, and I started doing some ads uh, and then I thought, you know what, I'm going to audition for the show. Um, even though people say not to, it's about image and I'm a fatty. 
I'm going to go have fun. <laughs> and I did. I just literally, I had to put my headset, put my mindset into a place where I blocked out other people um, and the negativity that was coming and focused on the positive. And that was the fact that I knew I could sing. And if other people would have, could appreciate that, then it would be okay. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, and getting out of your own way and what and not thinking what other people are thinking about you is really good because m when someone is in an audience, they're usually there to to because they want to be there anyway. So yeah, fantastic. Now, you, since you've been on the pop stars and you've now been on many TV, you've been performing or all around. You were DJing the other day. You're always doing something. Give us your tips on overcoming fear or, or nerves before you go live on air or performing. What are your tips? What do you do? Do you breathe? Are you thinking something? What's going there, on in there, your head? There are a few little different things that you could do. I, there's a really good, um, a really good tip or a trick um, that if you at home by yourself, and this is you know, way before you're performing or way before you're getting on air, um, you know, find a little spot in your hand, say you're going to press on your thumb, and sit down on your bed, and you just think of a good, think of a great moment. Think of something that makes you happy, almost like a bit of a meditation, and just press that spot, and just practice that every day when you've got time. Think of that happy moment, press that spot. Think of that happy moment, press that spot, and you find that when you're in the middle, or when you're just about to go on stage, and you, you know, you get so overcome by the, your nerves that it starts to block you. Just press that. And it'll, it's almost a body memory to remind you of that happy moment again. So it's a really it's a bit like an anchor. Yeah. yeah. It takes some build up, and but it just will take you that to that moment where it'll pull you back. I always say though, it's great to have nerves because it reminds you one that this is important. Because if you didn't get nervous about doing something, you 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 wouldn't think. I I think when you stop getting a bit nervous, you stop thinking it's important. Um, yeah. Or you stop caring about it, and I still get a bit nervous. Um, you know, it doesn't mean it stops me. And I can sometimes it gets to the point where I get so nervous, I think I'm going to forget my lyrics. <laughs> really? Yeah, I still go through those moments, or I'm going to forget what I, you know, what I'm what I have to say, and it all comes back to. And, and I I taught students and uh, on singing, and I always say. Practice makes perfect. It is such a simple line, and it's and I have to hear it all the time and think that's so stupid. Like, but practice makes perfect. If you've practiced it over and over and over again, nothing will affect it. Like, you will get up on stage and it'll come back to you because you've practiced it so much. Well, that's what I believe. That's a bit what um, Blake was saying before too about the preparation, getting in there and prepare. And uh, you're so right about the practicing. Yeah. About that. Now tell us, while I've got you here, tell us a little bit about your blogging. Um, well, I started uh, a blog a couple of years ago called Under the Collector. Um, and it was just about, I used to have friends ring me up and say, can you recommend a place to eat? Uh, where's a good place to shop if I want a discount? And, uh, you know, I had friends emailing me or they were suggesting me to people you know, bring Arnett if you want to find out where the best place to eat is. So I started a blog called Arnett the Collector. I thought I might as well use it. Um, and it just started snowballing and I was getting invited to launches and events. Um, and just not long after that, I decided I was going to lose the weight. So I thought, okay, um, during 2011, I had to stop Arnett the Collector because um, Losing 89 kilos and going out and trying food or going to food launches wasn't sort of didn't sort of go hand <laughs> in hand. So yeah. I stopped. Um, and once I finished, um, I decided I want to start Rogue Home. So Rogue Home was born, and I thought I'd aim it more at the gentlemen, discerning gentlemen out there. And I talk about fitness, food, and lifestyle, and it covers everything from you know what's in fashion, but more relevant to people. So. I might look at what's in fashion on the European catwalks and make it sort of more relevant to Australians. Um, and I try to be careful not to not to be too highfalutin or, you know, I've got a friend that will make comments on my Instagram photos and he's like, oh, that's a bit too fruity. Um, and so, 
I've, I've had to learn to, I'm trying to cater to the everyday guy that will, will not normally read, the, read a blog about fashion or lifestyle and might want to know a few things because he's going on a date and he wants to look his best or where to eat or where to take someone for breakfast. Um, so yeah, so the blog covers that and we're just about to relaunch, which is fantastic and it's going to be a bigger and better website and I'm excited. Yes, I'm excited for you as well. And uh, you are not you are a performer obviously and a very, very be beautiful voice. I love listening to you sing and it's just fantastic and we will give your SoundCloud and your website away soon as well. <laughs> now you're also MC, DJ <laughs> and uh, you're put, you've got a keynote to to talk about as well, of course, and that comes back down to practice. And I know you've been spending a lot of time in preparation for that as well. Yep. So that's great. So, give us uh, as an MC, yep. what do what tips can you give for any of our people who are listening who may need to MC an event for, of their own, or what what should they be doing? I I just think you when you're up on stage, you've got to remember you're there to. Facilitate. Are you there to help people have fun or enjoy the evening? Or if it's you know a conference, you there to keep the day moving on? Um, you know, don't forget to let people know that you know they're not just an audience; they're there to participate as well. Um, and I think if you find, I think it's always great is when you first come on stage to interact with the audience in some sort of way. Um, you know, like I've I've gone to events where they say you know get everybody up and they play a song, and you know at first you think oh that's so silly. But it works, you know. It gets yeah. people to stop being nervous, and it gets people to open up and feel a bit freer, um, you know. And I was talking to a friend recently. She's hosting um, uh, the Indigenous Awards that are coming up. Um, Casey Donovan and I said, to her, I said, you know, the preparation for that is different from the preparation for singing. How, what are you doing? And she said, Well, I've got notes. I know what I'm speaking about. I'm just basically there to keep the night moving. And she said, and so I'm going to keep reminding people that one, you're here for a good time, so have fun, and let's get behind these people that are coming up. And that's was her three things. She, those are three things. And she said, throughout the night, that's all I'm going to be driving through is, you're here to have fun, so don't forget to get up if you want to get up and move when the music's playing. Let's get behind the people that are nominated. You know, let's all support them, and at the end of the day, enjoy yourself. So that was yeah. really interesting because you know. If you find three key things to talk, to remind yourself throughout the e day or throughout the evening, um, it'll always stay in there, and you just cycle through that. Yeah. Have you ever had a time when you you did forget the lyrics? Yeah. On stage. Oh yeah. <laughs> you did. So how do what what's the damage control? What do you do to, to um, recover from that? I've learned to make up lyrics. I'm really good at <laughs> I'm really good at that. Um, there's a certain YouTube video that if you listen closely, <laughs> which was a live... Is it the one I like? <laughs> is it the no, favorite, it my favorite? No, it was a live video recording and there's some lyric changes. And that's it, you know, if you're if you're in the middle of the song and something happens um, that distracts you, you forget it. I've just learned to make it up as I go along, so you have to. you ha Like, you have to. And if you stay in that moment, no one will know. Well, that's very, very good. Now, you did... Say before that we were talking about that you're putting together your own presentation, your keynote presentation. Tell us what's what's involved in that. What are you going to be talking about? Um, so it's you know it's talking about the experience that I went through with the weight loss and you know the motivation that came behind it and the motivation to keep it off. But then it also goes all the way back to the beginning as a little kid growing up in Fiji in a one room house with no money um, and having this dream that one day I'd be singing, um, one day I'd sing for people, one day I'd be on TV, um, and not being able to see that link, but somehow holding on to that dream. And, and I think sometimes when we have dreams, because we're such a visual nation, this is always such a visual, like in this day and age, everyone wants to see things or have it instantly. And mm. when you have a vision or a dream, you, know, you don't always see it, and you can't always have it physically straight away. So there's an element of faith that comes in, and we forget. You know, I remember learning as a kid at church that uh, a, a, a verse that said, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things you don't see. So it's that you believe, you hold on to the dream, 
but you also action it. And so as I grew up, I would practice my singing. And I would go out there and I would challenge myself and perform in competitions. And um, and that's what I talk about. And I talk about being empowered by uh, by pain, being empowered by things that hold you back and not letting you hold you back. Um, for example, uh, in the beginning of my weight loss journey, we bought a set of scales to weigh myself. And I got on and it said error. <laughs> you know, and it could have, it could have, if I'd let it, it could have stopped me. But I used it to empower myself to go on because I was like, I will not stop until I see a reading on these scales. So yeah, it talks through the, the, you know, talks through dreaming and believing, and you know, it's not just these highfalutin things that creative people do. It's actually you can actually harness it and utilize it in businesses. Like you set goals and you set dreams, um, and you work towards it, and you don't always see it straight away. But if you keep at it. You know, there, there does come a time when you do some things. Yeah, well, you did mention before, too, that when you were doing the pop stars and everyone was being really negative, that you didn't let that into your head. You just kept going, and I really admire you for that. That's tough. I remember, yeah, well, I remember dancing, and, it, and we were up in Queensland, and the dancer auditions, and there were massive groups of people, and they had to keep culling every day. And I remember coming out and staying on par with the dancing and trying to keep dancing. This big, big guy... I'm so glad there was no YouTube back then because there'd be videos all over YouTube of me dancing, and it wasn't a pretty, wasn't a pretty sight. But I remember doing that and going into the bathrooms, and my mum always said, "You smile at the cameras, and you, you know, you be positive. You never be negative." And I'd go into the bathroom, have a cry, wash my face, oh. <laughs> come out, and say, "It's fantastic. I'm enjoying myself," you know. And it was like, I have to stay positive. No one else was going to do it for me. I had to do it myself. So. That's so true. And it's so true too, too. You can't just take on everyone else's negativity or what they think is best for you. And I, I live my life like that. Look, I've had so many people say, oh, go and get a real job. What are you doing when you're building your business and all that stuff? And I keep going because I know it's right for me and that's important. Yeah. And it's just getting out there and... Facing your fears, really, isn't it? That's, that's and it comes down to your passions. Like you're passionate about it, and you can see you're passionate yes. about it, and you're passionate about the people that you put out there, that you, you know, the speakers that you represent, and it shows. And people sort of go, "I want to be that. I want to. I want to. See, I want to be a part of what she's doing." So yeah, I think it's, that it's passion. It's all fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's all fun. I mean, you know, I I didn't when my own story. I fell into the speaking industry about. Ten years ago, in Fiji, actually, I was over in Fiji, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's a funny story. But I was dating a, a speaker at the time called the Corporate Ninja, and um, he took me over there to Fiji. And he said, "I said to him, well, how do I get a part of this? Because I was an office manager at the time." And he said, "Well, you go back and start a bureau, or become a speaker." And I just went, "Okay." And I don't know how I did it, but I just did it, like with no really. I just taught myself, and here I am. So same with the radio. It's just you just get out there and do it, don't you? Get have a go. That's what, that's, what I I say. that's what I always say to people. I said there's always little signs along this journey that we call life, and a lot of times we miss the signs. Whereas you saw that sign, and you know you veered off into that that the pathway that you now you are now on. And that's what I yeah. think. I think I think we forget sometimes that there's always little signs that pop up that you know that want to direct us in a certain way and. If we don't see them or we don't follow them, then we sort of lose that passion. Yeah, that's quite true. Seize every opportunity. That's that's definitely yeah. good advice there. And um, you certainly have done that, and you've come such a, a long way. And um, as I said, I'm so amazed at your your music. It's if you haven't listened to Arnett Olsen, I really suggest you go on YouTube this straight after this show because he's really worth listening to. <laughs> now, Arnett, what else can you tell us about uh, nerves and, and just say we're talking, we've talked a lot about you're a performer and I'm in the speaking industry, but what say you're a, a business owner or a salesperson who's been told you have to do a great presentation. We've talked about the... Um, preparing, um, the breathing, anything else that you can share with us? I just, um, I think the thing with nerves is that you all there, it's always going to be nerves, you know, you can't discount the fact that it's there, there's no magic pill that will take it away, and it's actually finding a way to harness the nerves and use it, um, and breathing, like he had said before, was a re is a really good technique, and 
a lot of people shallow breathe. So as a performer, you you learn to breathe into your diaphragm. Um, but a lot of people, if you ask them to breathe in, they normally suck it into the chest first. Um, so a really good tip is like if you breathe in and you think that your stomach is a balloon and so you're filling it up with air and you want to push the air down yeah. as far as you can and you want to expand your diaphragm out, which means your stomach's going to come out. So um, for some reason, when I ask students that I've taught in the past you know, to breathe in, they suck their stomach in, and I don't know if it's yeah. coming from the point of us, you know, trying to hold our stomach in because it's too big. But um, you're you meant to actually expand your diaphragm. So the breath is meant to go into your body. It's not a shallow breath. It's into the diaphragm. Expand your diaphragm and hold the air there, and then control it. Um, and another really good trick that I do to open the vocal cords because the voice is the only involuntary muscle in the body. Um, you know, your hand, if you want to move it, you can think about moving your hand. But with the vocal cords, the only way you can stretch it or exercise it is to actually physically, you know, either hum or, you know, tri trill. So in the morning when you get up and if your voice is quite blocked, a really good tip is to put the tip of your tongue behind your bottom teeth and you're going to say, nine, ninai, nino, ninu. And it sounds really stupid. But what it, does is, what it does is it forces your vocal cords, because your tongue, you rely on the tongue a lot to shape the sounds that we produce. Um, it stops the tongue from being used, and it forces the vocal cords to open. Um, and for singers, that's what you want. You want the vocal cords to be controlling the air that's coming out. And it's the same with speaking. So in the tip of your tongue, either on the top of your te teeth or the bottom teeth, and you say, nine, ninai, nino, ninu. And it just forces the vocal cords to open up, so it creates a clearer sound as well. Um, and by doing that, it actually helps you with your breathing. And then I think a lot of times when I warm up, it helps me with my nerves. <coughs> yeah, that's great advice. Thank you, Anna. That's fabulous. We'll have to put that those words on our blog and get that so people can have a look and at that. Me, put it on. Like you sound hilarious, but it's really, <laughs> really good. I think actually that that makes me think of something else that with life and with everything you do, you've got to be able to laugh at yourself, don't yeah. you? Because if you can't laugh at yourself and find the funny thing about things, well, you know, that's my secret to life anyway. So like sometimes I really make a goose of myself, but you know, that's life. That's Demi. <laughs> that's what happens. I just asked my friends what I sound like before a gig. You know, I've got 45 minutes of vocal warm ups before any performance that I do. And it's the same with speaking, no. I, I warm up as well. Because um, you need to open up your your soft palate and your hard palate around the mouth, and you know things like <laughs> actually loosen up your lips a bit, um, and they will help. Like they will help with performance performances. So yeah, I do look and sound a bit silly, but at the end of the day, sometimes that fun stuff actually helps you. Yeah, you. and I mean you're you're very experienced. You've been how long have you actually been a performer for? Like, I know you started as a child, but yeah, professionally. I've been singing since I was a kid and never really stopped. Like, um, when I was younger, doing competitions um, and getting up as wherever I could to perform. And, you know, the great thing about singing in church is it's always an opportunity to sing. You know, if there's not Christmas, there's Easter, there's, you know, something going on, there's a concert, there's a, you know, performance. So there's always the opportunity. And... I've got a few, quite a few friends now that sing around Australia that were the same. They came through from singing in church. And it's a great place. I learned how to get up in front of a crowd and speak. And I learned to speak about what I was passionate about. And I used to always just remind myself, you know, I have three main things I want to talk about. And then I have stories that I add with them. And because there are moments in my life that I've experienced, it's easier to remember. Yes. And it's easier then to find a reason to link them back to what it is you're speaking about. And it's the same thing with, I found, with writing a keynote or getting up and speaking, you know. Those moments that people will relate to are the moments that in your life that you've experienced. And people can go, oh, okay, I've been through that or I know what he's, I understand what he's talking about. Yeah, I mean, your story is lovely and I'm sure a lot of people can relate to you because you're just an everyday guy who's, you know, Come up here, you had a dream and you just went out there and pursued it and I just love it. You know, we always have a few laughs together. You, you, I think you're amazing and 
I wish you could. Um, we, we should have actually been a bit more prepared and had one of your songs ready to sing on this tonight. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Oh no 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 no! <laughs> well, I should have. We'll, we'll, we'll direct people to the YouTube, and we've got a few more minutes left to to continue. Now, as part of the other thing that you you do the other day, which fascinated me, was your DJing in front of a very important event that we both attended. Where did you get the skills to do that? Um. I literally, because I sing with a lot of DJs, um, I started picking it up along the way and I started getting asked um, to DJ a lot of fashion events because I work as a stylist as well. And I thought, well, if I'm going to do it, I've got to, you know, actually learn some skills. So I've got a little setup here at home um, and I practice on it, you know, every, every now and then. But, you know, it's just an extension. I think with everything that people do in life, but there's always a little extension to what it is you do. So like with my singing, there's the extension is DJing and the extension is fashion styling because I like looking after myself. So there's all these other little extensions that you can do. And I think if you find the time to nurture it, there's, you know, there's things that you can get out of it. And I think it's the same with DJing. It's opened up a lot of doors and you know, got me to DJ at some amazing events, listening to some amazing people speak. So I'm really happy about that. Yes, and actually that takes me to another point. We were having a chat after the event. We went to the Lisa Messenger's event last week and you were saying that you were intently listening to, um, we had Lane Beachley and Mia Friedman and uh, Lorna Jane and of course Bianca Dice. It was a pretty amazing event and uh, you were telling me how you were listening intently and picking up on some of the tips that they were talking about and how they spoke. So it's yeah. about observing other people. Yeah, and I think that's the biggest thing is like we've got to remember that there are people around us every day that do some amazing things and if we remember that, um, you know, we can harness it and um, it's always good to be observant. I think a lot of people live life and they don't notice what's going on around them and I think being observant is fantastic because it keeps you aware and also you can learn a lot. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, your story is quite amazing. Now, just give us the websites where people can find you. Uh, so it's www.arnottolson, A-R-R-N-O-T-T-O-L-S-S-E-N.com and that's got all my music stuff on it and then the blog is www.roguehome.com, R-O-G-U-E-H-O-M-M-E and uh, Instagram is at Arnott Olson or Twitter is at Arnott. Well, let's just talk, tell everyone about that as well because you're very, very big on social media. No doubt you'll be um, tweeting and so Instagramming and all sorts of things for us with this show. Give us your following on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Um, Instagram's almost at 17,000 now, which is, which is really good. It's been growing. Um, Twitter's at 9,000, um, so I'm really happy about that. And then on Facebook, we've got about 9,000 on one and uh, 4,000 on the other. So. Um, yes, yeah, so I love social media. Um, it's a great way of getting, um, of sharing and getting your music out there. Um, and I just think of it, it's like, a, it's like having an audience and giving a keynote. You know, you're sharing bits of information throughout the day, whether people want to or not, they're getting it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're certainly getting a lot of photos from you with that Instagram following. That's pretty amazing. And I, you know, I'm, I know you're always around Surrey Hills, snapping everyone in good clothes and having a bit of an opinion, so that's fantastic. Well, look, Anna, it's been a pleasure to have you on the Thank show. I, it's, I'm sure everyone ha has learnt a lot from listening to you and we can send you send them all to your SoundCloud, which is, is that just if on you your go, website, yeah, SoundCloud? Yeah, if you go to the website at arnadawson.com, it's got the Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and SoundCloud on there as well. So. Yeah, and uh, we'll hopefully if there's anyone out there that might want to know more about Arnott, give me a call or find me on voxpresenters.com and we'll um, organise for him to inspire everybody and make a difference. So thank you so much. I think thank we're just you, about done. <laughs> thank you. Bye Arnott. Thanks.